a Torah verse-by-verse commentary of Paul's second epistle to Timothy. Introduction Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy from his second incarceration in Rome. Following the great fire of Rome in 64 AD, Nero had vilified the Christians, labelling them as incendiaries, snowballing into the great persecution which ensued. With the target on every believer's back, multitudes deserted the faith, denying Yeshua for the sake of their lives. Young Timothy, based in Ephesus, undoubtedly feared for his life too, and would have found himself in a quandary, being tempted to throw in the towel as his former fellow saints had done. It is with much urgency then that Paul felt obliged to deliver his protege from so sure eternal damnation through an emotional plea penned in this very personal epistle to Timothy. Paul in his great wisdom, acquired through many years of Holy Spirit-led ministry, fraught with trials and tribulations, multiple brushes with death, debates, floggings, robberies, hunger, imprisonment, despair and disappointment, all for the furtherance of the gospel, had much experiential and evidential exhortation to impart to his fellow beloved son in Messiah. Paul, aware of his impending execution, so desperately wished to see Timothy one more time, and implored for Timothy to hastily visit him before his appointment with death. Timothy was encouraged to continue in the faith inherited from his mother and grandmother, and to shun fear and place all his faith in Yeshua, his source of power, love, and a sound mind. Timothy was to emulate the likes of Onesiphorus, who had embraced the bigger picture, understanding that greater rewards in the afterlife awaited those who persevered in the faith in the most troubling of times. Timothy was to turn his back on the pleasures of this world and focus on the gospel and its evangelism in all quarters, never denying Messiah. Using and rightly dividing Bible as the only source of truth, Timothy was further encouraged to extricate himself from pointless debates which attracted division within the body of Messiah. He was furthermore to be wary of impending apostasy and the infestation of charlatan leaders within the Ecclesia who would bring great evil. These men were not to be tolerated but resisted using knowledge from scripture with the hope of even winning back these depraved souls for the kingdom. Paul closes by reminding Timothy to visit him at his earliest convenience and by exchanging salutations from other saints as was his custom. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, by the will of Elohim, according to the promise of life which is in Messiah Yeshua. Paul was chosen personally by Yeshua the Messiah, as seen in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 to 16. This reads, But the Master said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. This was Yeshua speaking in reference to Paul, or Saul, before he was called Paul. It was indeed, and still is, the will of Elohim, that we, who are the called of his son Yeshua, and respond to this invitation to serve him, following his commandments, are to inherit eternal life. Compare John 5 verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Also, John 6 verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13. 
and this is the record, that Elohim hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of Elohim hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of Elohim, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of Elohim. And John 15 verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Chapter 1 verse 2, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from Elohim the Father and Messiah, Yeshua, our Master. Timotheos, which is Greek for honoring Elohim, was a Lyconian from the city of Lystra in Asia Minor. Being Paul's protege, fellow laborer, and traveling companion, whose father was Greek and his mother a Jewess as we see in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him, because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father, they, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Note that he was circumcised in order to be seen to be upholding Torah, lest his attempts to preach to the Jews be deemed futile. If the law was abolished as erroneously claimed, Paul would not have felt it prudent to carry out this procedure. Paul always wished grace, mercy, and peace upon the recipients of his epistles. We find this theme of grace and peace from Elohim being wished upon his people in the Tanakh, or Old Testament, in Numbers 6, verses 25 to 26. Yehovah, make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. Yehovah, lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. It is important to know that the Father and the Son are separate entities in the triune Elohim head, the Father being referred to in Paul's epistles as Elohim and Yeshua as our Master. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the Comforter as seen in John 14 verses 15 to 17. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and is the Spirit of him and his Son Yeshua, as we see in John 15 verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And if you compare this with Galatians 4 verse 6, And because ye are sons, Elohim hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we see that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and also is sent forth uh, from the Father um, into our hearts as the Spirit of his Son, Yeshua. We also see in Romans 8 verses 9 and verse 14, Romans 8 verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of Elohim dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Messiah, he is none of his. And also in verse 14, For as many as are led by the spirit of Elohim, they are the sons of Elohim. So we see in both, especially in verse 9, 
that the Spirit is the Spirit of Elohim dwelling in us, and also that Spirit dwelling in us is the Spirit of Messiah, and Messiah is the Son, so Elohim the Father and Elohim the Son. So the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of Elohim the Father and and of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Son. And this being the case, fully completes the triune nature of the Elohim head, which dwells within the name Yehovah. Chapter 1, verse 3. I thank Elohim, who I, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul served the same Elohim, Yehovah, as his father, as his forefathers, that's to say, the same Torah giving Elohim. It would be inexplicable of him and contrary to scripture and to Paul's beliefs for him to have not obeyed Torah. There is no evidence throughout the book of Acts that he contravened Torah. Let's have a few let's have a look at a few points of scripture in the book of Acts, starting with Acts chapter 23, verses 1 to 3, to substance to substantiate the statement. Acts 23, verses 1 to 3. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before Elohim until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, Elohim shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and command, commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Also, Acts 24, verses 9 to 16. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city." Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the Elohim of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward Elohim, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward Elohim and toward men. Acts 25, verses 7 and 8. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. And finally, Acts 28, verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they, they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem, into the hands of the Romans. I think this is more than enough evidence that Paul never broke Torah. The sunetasis, which is Greek for conscience, is the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad, prompting to do the former and shun the latter, commending one, condemning the other. Only the Torah is the blueprint upon which we may distinguish good from bad. There is no other document in the whole Bible available for us to refer to. To have a good conscience requires us to walk in Elohim's ways, following the commandments of his Son, and confessing our sins when we acknowledge them, 
in order for the conscience to remain kataros, which is Greek for pure or clean. Let's read John 15 verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Also, 1 John 1 verses 5 to 9. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Note also that Paul prayed night and day. The day according to Elohim, and as understood by all the characters in the Bible, began in the evening and ended in the day. Hence why in this epistle it is written Paul it is written as Paul pray night and day, not day and night, but night and day. And we can prove this by reading Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, and 31. We shall start with Genesis 1, verse 5. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And then verse 8. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 13, And the evening and the morning were the third day. Verse 19, And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 23, And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And lastly, verse 31, And Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. A pure conscience stems out of anupokritos, which is Greek for unfeigned or sincere. So a pure conscience stems out of unfeigned or sincere faith. Faith is defined in Joshua chapter 1, this being derived from comparing that chapter with Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3 and verse 30. So let's read Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 3 first. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Elohim, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then if we skip to verse 30, it reads, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after the they were compassed about seven days. So this, this is in reference to the days of Joshua. Now if you go to Joshua chapter 1, uh, verses 5 to 8, it clearly defines these qualities of faith. So just to summarize, Hebrews 11 verse 30 refers to the escapades of Joshua. It is interesting to note that the word faith does not appear in the book of Joshua, yet he is amongst the elders who by it obtained a good report, as we are told in Hebrews, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Now Joshua 1 verses 5 to 8 clearly defines these qualities of faith as being 
A. Let's first of all read it. Joshua 1 verses 5 to 8. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was, as I was with Moses. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy, their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So Joshua 1 verses 5 to 8 clearly defines these qualities of faith as being chasach, chasach, which is the Hebrew for strong or able to prevail. B, amatz, which is Hebrew for of good courage or being brave. C, observing the Torah, which is the embodiment of Yeshua. And D, meditating day and night on the Torah, which is to constantly be on our lips. This faith is then is to then make us a tzalach, which is Hebrew for prosperous in spirit, soul and body. And also b is to, the faith is to make us sakal, which is Hebrew for prudent, wise, circumspect and successful. So, without mentioning the Hebrew words, I'll just repeat this. Joshua 1, 5-8 defines the qualities of faith as being strong or able to prevail, of good courage and brave, observing the Torah, which is the embodiment of Yeshua, and meditating day and night on the Torah, which is to constantly be on our lips. This faith is then to make us prosperous in spirit, soul and body, and to be prudent, wise, circumspect, and successful. This true quality of faith is rare to find in Christians, considering that the majority believe Torah has been abolished. Paul found great anticipatory joy in meeting again with Timothy, as this true faith had been instilled in him by his mother Eunice which is Greek for good victory, having been passed down to her by her mother Lois, which is Greek for agreeable, as Torah required. Let's read Deuteronomy 4 verses 9 to 10 to get an understanding of this. Only take ye to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Especially the day that thou stoodest before Yehovah thy Elohim in Horeb, when Yehovah said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. So Eunice and Lois clearly had abided by this commandment. Also in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by, th by, thy, by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Also, chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, 
and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by, by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So we are to, con we are to continuously teach our children Torah truths. Continuously. When we wake up, when we lie down, when we rise up, when you walk us by the way, when we sit us in thine house, we meant to be speaking Torah to our children all the time. It is very, very important. And by so doing, we are demonstrating faith. Some of the qualities, one of the qualities of faith is following Torah, which our children need to have from the get-go. Chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of Elohim which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. This is evidence of elders in the church transferring gifts of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of which Paul did to Timothy. It is essential to learn from this verse that although the gifts of the Holy Spirit may reside in a Christian, they will remain dormant lest that receiver stir them up through action. Many a Christian are unaware of the overflowing abundance of power residing in their hearts which can only be utilized by the exercising of the faith. We are to actively seek the captives to set them free through demonstration of power such as healing, casting out demons, prophesying through exercising the faith given us, being strong, courageous and Torah observant for maximal effect. Let's read Hebrews 5 verses 12 to 14. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of Elohim, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meats. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we're supposed to be exercising our faith if we are to be amongst those who are of strong meat. Otherwise, if we are not exercising our faith, we are simply those who are in need of milk, who need to be taught the first principles of the oracles of Elohim, which means basic Bible. Also in Ephesians 6 verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Chapter 2 verse 7. For Elohim hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sophronismos, which is Greek, which is the Greek word translated sound mind, also means self-control. Dahlia, which is Greek for fear or cowardice, leads to A, doctrinal error, B, rebellion, and C, destruction. Through renewal of our mind, as seen in Romans 12 verse 2, things of this world no longer concern us. Let's have a read of Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. I beseech you therefore, sorry, Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. By allowing the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts to guide us into renewing our minds, we gravitate towards following Elohim's commandments, which ultimately is the good and perfect will of Elohim, as inferenced from the following scripture. Romans 7 verse 12 Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 for this is the will of Elohim, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. 
John 7 verse 7 The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And also, verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of Elohim or whether I speak of myself. And verse 19, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? Following the commandments of Elohim as Yeshua does allows the Holy Spirit to continue dwelling in us, as we've read already twice in John 15 verse 10. Love, of which the Spirit of Elohim represents, then casts out all fear. Compare 1 John 4 verses 4 and 18. 1 John 4 verse 4 Ye are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So A. Fear leads to doctrinal error and jeopardizes advancement advancement in the spiritual warfare. Compare Proverbs 29 verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in Yehovah shall be safe. And Judges 7 verse 3. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Pastors, teachers and preachers must never step onto the pulpit if they are afraid of addressing doctrinal truth. This particularly pertains to those pastors who compromise the truth for the sake of comforting for the sake of conforming to errant denominational beliefs in fear of being ostracized or even expelled for preaching biblical truth, which causes offense. Compare Galatians 2 verses 11 and 12 for a demonstration of this. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to, to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. B. Fear leads to rebellion and stubbornness, which are equated with witchcraft and idolatry, with grave consequences, as we see in 1 Samuel 15 verse 24. Actually, starting from verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of Jehovah and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So the fear of Saul had disastrous consequences, for he rebelled and was stubborn against Jehovah, and this led him to being rejected as the king of Israel. And lastly, C. Fear leads to destruction. Failing to do Elohim's will ultimately leads in his rejection of such, such an one, culminating in destruction of the soul, meaning being sent to hell. Compare Jeremiah 38 verses 19 to 20. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of Jehovah, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. Chapter 1, verse 8. 
Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our master, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partake of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of Elohim. Second Timothy 4 verse 22 closes the epistle by informing us of Paul being brought before the tyrannical emperor Nero a second time. Nero had the spirit of Antichrist, and some at the time believed him to be the Antichrist prophesied in scripture. He brought much misery to the Christians, having condemned them as the enemies of the Roman Empire, blaming them for the burning of Rome in July AD 64. It had become dangerous to be associated with the faith, and especially to be known to be liaising with the elders of the ecclesia, of whom were considered troublesome. For this reason, Paul exhorted Timothy to not be afraid, nor to forsake the gospel and Paul, him and Paul himself, but rather to tackle the afflictions and persecutions head-on in the power of the spirit of Elohim, which is more superior and capable of overcoming all manner of adversity. If this power of Elohim could make us hopeless, could make us hopeless sinners partakers of the gospel, which is a great miracle in itself, how much more likely it is for Elohim to succor us in times of affliction, which surely would be less of an, of an effort than that spent in redeeming us from the kingdom of Satan when we were yet sinners. We should not fear to be in any earthly prison, but rejoice instead in being prisoners of a righteous taskmaster, Yeshua the Just. Suffering for the gospel, though daunting, should be embraced with joy, as this is surety of heavenly riches in return for having rattled the kingdom of Satan. Let's have a read of Matthew 10 verses 31 to 33. Fear ye not therefore, Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Also Mark 8 verses 35 to 38. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Chapter 1 verse 9 Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Messiah Yeshua before the world began. Sozo, translated saved, in this instant, in this instance, should be rendered delivered. We are only saved at the very end of a successful Christian walk. Deliverance from the kingdom of Satan is the first stage in reconciliation with Elohim. This is achieved by simply having faith in his son who shed his redemptive blood for all. The gospel needs to be preached first for one to know who to call unto for deliverance. The delivered souls who respond to the call of Messiah are then justified and sanctified by the blood of Yeshua for the Holy Spirit of truth to then lead one on a path of renewal of the mind to conform to that of the Son of Elohim unto salvation which awaits the overcomers. This whole plan was preordained before the foundation of the world and our, works and our works prior to being redeemed and justified by faith are futile in bringing us onto the path that leads to salvation. So let's, let's, let's look at each of these steps. Starting with A, deliverance. Let's read Joel 2 verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yehovah shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yehovah had said. 
and in the remnants whom Jehovah shall call. <clears throat> also Romans 10 verses 13 to 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of Jehovah shall be saved. As you can see, this is quoting Joel 2 verse 32. However, it's been wrongly quoted that the word sozo has been translated saved instead of delivered as it is in Joel 2 verse 32. But let's carry on. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. There's a quote of Isaiah 52 verse 7. The next step is B, election unto justification. And we see in Romans 8 verses 29 to 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Also in Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 5, According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yeshua the Messiah to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Titus 3 verses 4 to 7 But after that the kindness and love of Elohim our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Yeshua the Messiah, our Saviour. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 Elohim is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son Yeshua the Messiah, our Master. And 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are actually elected unto justification. We are called unto justification. And it's only those who respond to the call who are justified. The next step is C, sanctification. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 2. Apologies, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 1, 1 and 2. Paul, called to be an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah through the will of Elohim and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of Elohim, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Messiah Yeshua, called to be saints with all that in every place, Call upon the name of Yeshua the Messiah, our Master, both theirs and ours. And also 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Master Yeshua and by the Spirit of our Elohim. The next step is D, renewal of the mind, Romans 12 verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. And lastly, this leads to salvation at the end of the Christian walk. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 Who are kept by the power of Elohim through, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Last time is the Greek words eskatos kairos, which means final set time, which is right at the end. 
and also in the same chapter, in verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So right at the end of our Christian walk in faith, we receive salvation of our souls. It's right at the end. Salvation is not at the beginning. Deliverance is at the beginning. Sozo has been wrongly translated salvation in some cases instead of deliverance, where it's meant to mean deliverance, which happens at the beginning. Although sozo in other contexts can mean salvation, we need to understand the context that we're reading the passage in scripture in for us to for us to uh, translate it correctly so there's no confusion we shall see later on in this epistle that it is important for us to rightly divide scripture so it's unfortunate that the king james version translators in some areas mixed up the translation for sozo which has caused a bit of confusion when one is trying to rightfully divides scripture let's move on chapter 1 verse 10 but is now made manifest by the appearing of our savior yeshua the messiah who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel the whole plan of salvation ordained before the world began manifested in the life death and resurrection of Yeshua, who through this gospel accomplished the aforementioned mystery of Elohim, which even Satan and his angels were not privy to. And we read this in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of Elohim in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which Elohim ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the king of glory. Also in Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 17. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to Elohim, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Chapter 1, verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul was indeed ordained by Yeshua himself, as we've seen in Acts 9 verse 15, to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, in addition to kings and the children of Israel. His three main areas of service were A. Kerux, which is translated preacher, which is Greek for a herald or proclaimer of the divine word. B. Apostolos, which is Greek for a delegate or ambassador or messenger of Messiah set forth with orders. And C. Didas, didaskalos, which is Greek for teachers who show men the way of salvation. Chapter 1 verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The present persecutions which Paul endured fazed him not, as he had a complete understanding of the fleeting nature of this world, and the greater glory that awaited him in the afterlife. Compare Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of Elohim unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Besides, he once had been a persecutor of the very faith which he now upheld and understood the blindness of the perpetrators thereof. 
and just compare this statement with 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. Who was before a blas blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And also Galatians 1 verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that, beyond measure, I persecuted the church of Elohim and wasted it. He thoroughly trusted that Yeshua, whom he believed, whom he believed in, would guard that parateki, which is Greek for special thing, consigned to his keeping, that's to say, the gospel of truth, against that day, which refers to the day which Yeshua would return in glory for the rewarding of the saints, as we see in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 10. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. This day Paul so greatly looked forward to, that it numbed the physical and mental wounds met by his earthly tormentors. Chapter 1 verse 13 Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Messiah Yeshua. Paul reiterated to Timothy to persevere through trial and tribulation and be comforted by the words derived from hupotuposis, which is Greek for an example or pattern of those who should hereafter believe. Paul paraphrased with saying to Timothy, Cling on tightly to the gospel of truth in this time of affliction, by the example of my conversation, that the same grace which I had obtained would not be wanting also to those who should hereafter believe. This Timothy was to do in faith and love, not of man, but in Messiah himself. Chapter 1 verse 14 That good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Accordingly, that parakatateke, which is Greek for special thing, consigned to Timothy's keeping, that's to say, the gospel of truth, was Timothy to equally guard by the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts, as much as Yeshua had guarded it for Paul. Chapter 1, verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are, are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Some Christians had feared so greatly the persecution of Nero against them as to have abandoned Paul, two examples being named as, as Phygelus, which is Greek for little fugitive, and Hermogenes, which is Greek for born of Mercury. Both these names seem to have foretold their nature of being anti-Christian. They represented the seed sowed on stony ground found in Mark chapter 4, verse 5, 16 and 17, which reads, Mark 4, Mark 4, verse 5. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And we find the explanation in verses 16 and 17. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Jehovah, give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. 
Onesiphorus, which is Greek for bringing profit, on the other hand, never forsook Paul, but sought him instead in the midst of danger and risk of death to assist him all he could. This conduct is becoming of true believers. Chapter 1 verse 18 The master grant unto him that he may find mercy of Jehovah in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Onesiphorus' conduct had a good track record, having been loving of all saints at all times, exemplified by his looking after Paul in Ephesus, of which Timothy would have recalled. Paul fittingly wished him Elohim's mercy in that day of the Bema Seat judgment of the saints at Yeshua's return. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Messiah Yeshua. Bearing in mind that the original epistle would not have had chapter breaks, Paul carries on with his train of thought from chapter 1 of exhortation to Timothy to not be fearful of persecution during the trying times that they were in, but to be strong as exemplified by Onesiphorus in the grace of Yeshua. This fits perfectly with Philippians 4 verse 13, which reads, I can do all things through Messiah which strengtheneth me. And also 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 to 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Messiah may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Messiah's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The grace of Elohim in us through his Son works in us to will and to do what is necessary to survive even in testing times. Chapter 2 verse 2 And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is further reinforcement of the words expressed in chapter 1 verse 13. Paul's ministry had been witnessed by multitudes of Gentiles and Israelites from all walks of life. Timothy was to present this to equally faithful Christians who walked in love and not in fear. That's to say, those who would not forsake the gospel. This was to encourage the dissemination and passing down of the gospel of truth to others by them as much as Lois had done for Eunice and, Eunice and Eunice for Timothy. Chapter 2 verse 3 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Yeshua the Messiah. Timothy was to be battle ready as his saviour. Compare Hebrews 12 verses 2 and 3. Looking unto Yeshua, the author and finishing, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of Elohim. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The crown of life awaits such overcomers as we see in James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Master hath promised to them that love him. The war would be spiritual, as seen in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, 
through Elohim to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Elohim and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Messiah. Chapter 2 verse 4 No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We should not be like the seed sown among thorns of Mark 4, verse 7, 18, and 19, which we shall read. Mark 4, verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And then 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. The Christian walk requires one to turn a blind eye on the secular world and focus wholeheartedly on the spiritual battle at hand. Being entangled in the affairs of the world carries the risk of not only forsaking the walk, but actually declining to an even lower state than before, as we see expressed in 2 Peter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Master and Saviour Yeshua the Messiah, they are again entangled therein and overcome the lat and therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Chapter 2 verse 5 And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Atheo, translated masteries, is Greek for contending in public games such as the Olympics. One can only win the crown or prize if they contest legitimately. If an earthly contender trains diligently and focuses intensely over a fleeting earthly crown that perishes, how much more should we intensely engage in spiritual warfare if we are to attain an imperishable heavenly crown? Let's read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9 verses 24 to 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize. So run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In the spiritual realm, we are to not only know but also follow the spiritual laws of warfare if we are to be victorious. Let's read Matthew 18 verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whosoever, so whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Also, John 14, verses 12 to 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Chapter 2 verse 6 The husbandman that laboureth must be first partaker of the fruits. Georgios, translated husbandman, is Greek for a farmer or vine dresser. Koplao, translated laboureth, is Greek for to labour with wearisome effort. Our Christian battle is not a walk in the park, 
but demands that we fight each battle tirelessly until victory is achieved. Compare Hebrews 10 verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of Elohim, ye might receive the promise. Chapter 2 verse 7. Consider what I say, and Yehovah give thee understanding in all things. All understanding comes from Yehovah. It is essential to seek understanding as Solomon did, if we are to be wise in strategizing our battles against the enemy. Compare 1 Kings 3 verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And 1 John 5 verse 20. And we know that the Son of Elohim is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Yeshua the Messiah. This is the true Elohim and eternal life. Chapter 2 verse 8 Remember that Yeshua the Messiah of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. By saying my gospel, Paul is not claiming that the gospel ushered from him, but rather that the gospel which was entrusted in him by Yeshua who lives in him was by default his. We as Christians who spread the true gospel free from guile may also refer to the gospel as ours, provided Yeshua's spirit in us is the only source of our guidance in preaching it. In these times of difficulty, Paul was encouraging Timothy to not even fear the prospect of death, as Yeshua was also a man of the seed of David, yet was resurrected from the dead, having conquered Satan in spiritual warfare. Yeshua's humanity is expressed here to encourage the downtrodden. This we should always bear in mind as we engage in what may seem at times to be a losing battle, especially when other fellow Christians desert us in our greatest hour of need. Chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of Elohim is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Messiah Yeshua with eternal glory. The days are coming and have already come for others, where Christianity shall be considered a criminal offence. The saints, as of times past, shall be shackled and cast into prison for their faith. However, we are to always remember that our bodies may be bound, but our souls shall never be imprisoned by the emissaries of Satan, provided we endure until the end. It is impossible to shackle the word of Elohim. Paul, having been the chief suppressor of the saints, was now most suppressed. He was prepared to die for the promotion of the gospel, despite having partaken in the death of former saints in his previous life of spiritual blindness. Even in prison, Paul never let an opportunity slip to preach the gospel. Let's see Ephesians 6 verses 19 to 20. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And also Acts 28 verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, they came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Elohim, persuading them concerning Yeshua, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, 
we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Timothy was further encouraged to endure even unto death as Paul's gospel in Yeshua faithfully upheld the belief in the resurrection of the saints unto eternal life, becoming co-regents with Messiah. If the spirit of Messiah is in us, then surely if Messiah was raised from the dead, we too shall follow suit as logic would infer. Compare Romans 6 verses 5 and 8. Romans 6 verse 5 For if we have planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And verse 8 Now, if we be dead with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with him. Colossians 3 verses 1 to 4 If ye then be risen with Messiah, seek those things which are above, where Messiah sitteth on the right hand of Elohim. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Messiah and Elohim. When Messiah, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Revelation 3 verse 21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Facing persecution is a litmus test for Christians which determines our eternal fate. Denying Yeshua in such circumstances carries in an irrevocably dire consequence, loss of salvation. Chapter 2 verse 13 If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This is a truly stern warning against those who throw in the towel when faced with affliction. Because Messiah cannot deny and go against his words stated in Matthew 10 verse 33 to 40. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth Father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. The sad reality of life is that Satan and his host of spiritual wickedness have, do, and shall in their persecution bring our loved ones into the fray. We may have to choose between them or Messiah. If one's wife or child or mother, for instance, were to be threatened with execution and their only source of release were to be our denial of Yeshua, would we be able to choose Messiah? As tough an option as this is, saints of old have managed to endure death of their loved ones for Messiah's sake. The Roman Catholic Church purged millions of believers over the last two millennia, utilizing all manner of torture in their endeavors to break the resolve of the believers of Messiah. Those dark days are on the horizon as this decadent, wicked world increasingly increasingly ramps up their anti-christian rhetoric chapter 2 verse 14 
of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the master that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. The them being referred to are the elect mentioned in verse 10, to whom Paul had been giving admonition in verses 11 to 13. The elect were being exhorted not to logomakeo, me logomakeo, which is translated that they strive not about words. A better translation would simply be that the elect desist from wrangling about empty and trifling matters. Such conduct would be completely superfluous and even worse would be destructive to the recipients of such vain disputations. We are to use what little time we have wisely and every word we utter shall be judged. If only mankind knew how important it is to watch every single word uttered and were to weigh them in the balance in determining whether the words would deny or permit them entry into the kingdom of heaven. Let's read Titus 3 verses 9 to 11. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Also Ephesians 5 verses 15 to 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of Jehovah is. Also Matthew 12 verses 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Chapter 2 verse 15 Study to show thyself approved unto Elohim, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Spudazo, translated study, is Greek for giving diligence or endeavouring. We indeed should endeavour to present ourselves acceptable unto Elohim as this is our reasonable service. This entails following his laws and commandments and living a holy life. Compare Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. Also, Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 7. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of Elohim and man. Trust in Jehovah with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear Jehovah, and depart from evil. True workmen or labourers of Yeshua must never be ashamed to preach Torah truth expounding it accurately without contradiction, rightly lined up with scripture. I pray that these commentaries have managed to stand this test for your edification, dear reader. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. But as we were allowed of Elohim to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but Elohim which trieth our hearts. And 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, 
nor handling the word of Elohim deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of Elohim. This, oh dear listener, I hope, is the effect that these, these commentaries are having on you. Chapter 2, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more unholiness. Bebelos, translated profane, may also be rendered heathenish. The Christian faith over the last two millennia has attracted much fruitless pagan and worldly debates, conferences and councils, which have progressively allowed for pagan doctrines and festivals to creep in and be permanently established within the churches under the guise of godliness. Easter, Lent, Christmas, and even more worryingly, Valentine's Day and Halloween have become well established and are celebrated by many a denomination. They all stem from the pit of hell, whose source, if anybody cared to casually investigate, is readily discovered to be from false god worship and pagan rituals. Eastern mysticism and New Age teachings have also found their way into churches, allowing for practices such as yoga, martial arts, and the Kundalini spirit to be deemed acceptable amongst greatly deceived churchgoers. All this leads to destruction of the soul, which is brought about by apathy amongst self-professed Christians who own Bibles that have gathered dust and still appear brand new, being never read nor studied for real truth. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Gagrena, translated canker, is Old English for gangrene, which kills living tissue with greater expediency than cancer, ultimately necessitating amputation. Corrupt interpretation of the logos, or the word, is spiritually gangrenous, as exemplified by Hymenaeus and Philetus, who were known heretics who lacked understanding of the concept of resurrection of the righteous dead unto eternal life. Hymenaeus' teachings were so perfidious and blasphemous that Paul even felt entrusted to deliver him unto Satan, as we see in 1 Timothy 1 verse 20. This reads, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme? Chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim standeth sure, having this seal. Jehovah knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Messiah depart from iniquity. Paul expresses the sturdiness of the foundation of the Ecclesia which Yeshua the cornerstone built upon a firm rock in his disciples. We see this in Revelation 21 verse 14. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Also Matthew 16 verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Those belonging to Yeshua are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 verse 13 In him ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22 Now he which establisheth us with you in Messiah, and hath anointed us, is Elohim, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts.
Those who know and are known of Yeshua are sealed by the Holy Spirit and are encouraged to not associate themselves with such vain babblers who try to corrupt gospel truth through false doctrinal teachings. Let's read number 16, verse 5. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow Yehovah will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. And Isaiah 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of Yehovah. Chapter 2 verse 20 But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. Every congregation in the body of Messiah is bound to have varying degrees of sanctity amongst its followers. This would range from the holiest, as precious as gold, to the barely saintly, as fragile earth. Within the ecclesia are also found the honorable who are heaven-bound and the dishonorable destined for damnation. This imagery typified by Paul is congruous with that of Yeshua's parable of the dragnet, in Matthew 13, verses 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good, the good into vessels but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 2 verse 21 If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Yeshua can only work through us via his Holy Spirit to do wondrous works such as healing, casting out demons, prophesying, and being in fullness of the gifts of the Spirit if we are to thoroughly cleanse ourselves. This can only be achieved through renewing of the mind and presenting our bodies blameless for him to operate in fullness through us. We must detach ourselves from all ungodliness meaning disassociation from dishonorable people and shunning all manner of evil. Let's read Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 again. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. Also, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dear beloved, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. Many Christians fail to be utilized by Messiah due to their refusal to detach themselves from the world and his bright lights. Chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on Yehovah out of a pure heart. It is a great shame that so much scandal rocks many churches of today. Pastors are found bed-hopping, sleeping with congregants, living ostentatiously in obscene wealth, sporting fleets of expensive vehicles, jewelry and mansions. Additionally, church leaders are found addicted to drugs, alcohol and pornography. All these are indeed representative of teenage desires, referred to by Paul as youthful lusts. 
Despite teenagers brought up by good parents being prepared to grow out of such desires once in their 20s, many a senior church congregant, through false doctrines leading to destruction, find themselves embroiled in these puerile lusts whose end is damnation. Let's read 1 Peter 2 verses 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they shall behold, glorify Elohim in the day of visitation. A kataros which is a pure or clean heart, is one that exhibits a daikaosune, which is Greek for integrity, righteousness, defined as law abiders in the Old Testament, as we see in Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The word just is the Hebrew word tzaddik, and tzaddik means lawful or righteous. So basically those who follow the law. For one to be lawful, you need to be a law abider. It's just common sense. A, a clean heart is also one that exhibits B, faith, which as we have seen in Joshua 1 verses 5 to 8 is defined as being courageous and strong to observe Torah which results in prosperity of spirit, soul and body. C. Agape which is Greek for brotherly love meaning loving thy neighbor as thyself upon which all Torah hinges. Matthew 22 verse 37 to 40 Yeshua said unto him, Thou shalt love Yehovah thy Elohim with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We also see in Leviticus 19 verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Yehovah. And finally, a clean heart is one that exhibits D, peace, which is harmony and lack of contention amongst brethren. Chapter 2, verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Moros, which is Greek for godless or foolish, and apejutos, which is Greek for ignorant or uneducated, arise from those who do not bother reading scripture, yet think they know it all. Many churches waste time and find themselves in a greater state of apostasy by virtue of their leaders entertaining prolonged debate over anti-biblical topics such as homosexuality, abortion, non-discipline of children and the like, which should not even be allowed to see the light of day in the house of Yah. Chapter 2 verse 24 And the servant of the master must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. The countermeasures to be taken by a true saint faced by such malcontents in the ecclesia should be to calmly and patiently open scripture in its full truthfulness and immediately shut down any form of ignorant babblings that may engender disputes within the ecclesia. There is truly power in the word of Elohim, which if used wisely, will save a congregation from the dark path of false doctrine that leads to destruction. This is the method that Yeshua used to even shut down the very arguments of Satan during his 40-day temptation in the wilderness. He simply used scripture 
to counter every lie by quoting, by quoting scripture. This narrative we find in Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11. Chapter 2 verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if Elohim peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It is important never to be sucked into screaming matches against those that choose to oppose biblical truths to justify the lusts of their flesh. Gentle teaching and correction through rightly dividing scripture is of paramount importance if there is to be any hope of convicting the heart of the deluded soul. Only after a first and second admonition are we to detach ourselves from them, lest they suck us into temptation. And we get this, or we find this exhortation in Titus 3 verse 10. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Also Galatians 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And also 1 John 5 verse 16. If any man see his brother's sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Ultimately, whether or not their hearts will be open to receiving truth lies with Elohim who shall have mercy on whomever he wishes. We need to be fully aware of the sad reality that some people's hearts are hardened by Elohim, particularly those who are insincere and proud, whom Elohim knows will never seek repentance, no matter how much evidence of truth is laid before them. This is endemic of present-day scientists, doctors and other worldly scholars fooled in their false sense of intelligence, trapped in the lies of science falsely called. We see this expressed in 1 Timothy 6 verses 20 to 21. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Also Romans 9 verses 8 and 14 to 24. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of Elohim, but the children of the promise are, ca are counted for the seed. And then 14 to 24. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with Elohim? Elohim forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of Elohim that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath, the mercy, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against Elohim? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Had not the potter power over the clay, or the same lump, to make one vessel unto honour, and another unto dishonour? What if Elohim, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And finally, chapter 2, verse 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. 
Ananepho translated that they may recover themselves in the Greek actually means to return to a sober state. A deluded mind stuck in the false lies of Satan is indeed comparable to a man in a deep stupor of inebriation. Satan not only has them in a snare, but also they find comfort in, a, in this deadly trap through great slumber. One cannot be convinced of truth until they actually realize what deep spiritual slumber they are in. This requires conviction by the Holy Spirit, despite our duty to preach the gospel of truth. It must be remembered that the gospel is not for everybody. Many shall choose to scorn it and prefer the beguiling slumber that Satan uses to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I thank Yeshua the Messiah that he dragged me out of so great a furnace of delusion and ignorance, and I live each day in the hope of leading but one extra soul towards the path of righteousness. Amen.